Hello, I'm Father James Kubicki. I'm the National Director of the Apostleship of Prayer, and I'm a Jesuit priest. And we've put together this little series to introduce you to a book that I wrote called A Heart on Fire, Rediscovering Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. I'd like to begin by introducing you to this book and where it came from. And by means of these reflections, we're hoping that we can help you go a little deeper into the material of this book and help you grow in your relationship with the Lord, which is a very heart-centered relationship. That's what we're called to, is not just to know about God, but to know God in a personal and intimate way. And you can't get more personal and intimate than to enter into the heart of another person and to share the desires of that heart. And so we have this little series to help you, as it were, go deeper into the heart of Jesus. First of all, where did this book come from? I didn't have any plan to write this book, but I was approached by Mr. Bob Hama, who is one of the editors of Ave Maria Press. And he had in his possession a book, an old book, published in 1951, called the Sacred Heart, Yesterday and Today. And in this book, we have the history of Sacred Heart devotion, but also it says, with a supplement containing prayers and devotions to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So this book, The Sacred Heart, Yesterday and Today, with a supplement containing prayers and devotions, came out in 1951. Bob Hama thought it was time for a new book, much like this one, that could help people understand why we have this devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and how we can grow deeper in that devotion. This book was written by Father Arthur McGrady, a Jesuit priest who, in the 1940s and 50s, was the national director of the Apostleship of Prayer. And so Bob, thought he would contact the present director of the Apostleship of Prayer, yours truly, and see if he would be willing to write a book that would be for a contemporary audience. That was me. He asked me. I was happy to take up the task because in my talks and parish missions and various teachings that I give, I have, as it were, taken the history of the Apostleship of Prayer and tried to make it more contemporary, more understandable for people today. And so I was happy to take on this task and pull together all the various things that I had already written and spoken about. Why was the Apostleship of Prayer director and a Jesuit chosen for this task of talking about the Sacred Heart of Jesus? Now that's a very interesting story because really it goes back to the 1600s. In 1673, our Lord appeared to St. Margaret Mary, and he revealed to her his heart all on fire with love. And she was not believed. People in her community and others thought that she was crazy and that she was just trying to draw attention to herself. Jesus sent to her a special spiritual director, one that he told her would help her and would confirm that these revelations of his heart to her were authentic. And that spiritual director was a Jesuit priest. He was canonized in 1992, and we call him now Saint Claude Le Colombier. He came as Saint Margaret Mary's confessor and spiritual director and confirmed that these revelations to her were authentic. He died at a very early age in his 40s. And later, St. Margaret Mary wrote a letter to her mother superior talking about a vision that she had had. This letter is dated July 1688. St. Claude had died in 1682, six years previous. In this letter to her mother superior, Sister Margaret Mary Alacoque wrote, the Blessed Virgin was on one side and St. Francis de Sales and the saintly Father La Colombière were on the other. 
The daughters of the visitation were there with their good angels beside them, seeming to hold each as a heart. So you see the picture of this vision. St. Margaret Mary sees our Blessed Mother, who on the one hand has St. Francis de Sales, the founder of the Visitation Order, and then also Father Colombier. And then Visitation Sisters representing the congregation. And in this vision, our mother, Blessed Mother, said that the Sisters of the Visitation would be the ones who would reveal to the world this great wealth of love that is symbolized by the Sacred Heart of Jesus and that devotion. And so she said, for it is given to the daughters of the visitation to know and distribute this devotion to others. However, and then she pointed to St. Claude Le Colombier, it is reserved to the fathers of your society to show and make known its utility and value so that people may profit from it by receiving it with the respect and gratitude due to so great a, a, a benefit. And then she says, in proportion as they give him this pleasure, this divine heart, source of blessings and graces, will shower them so abundantly on the works of their ministry that they will produce fruits far beyond their labors and expectations. So it's a very great promise that Mary herself gave to St. Margaret Mary and to the Jesuits. It was after that then that a Jesuit, another French Jesuit, was the spiritual director for St. Margaret Mary and his name was Father Jean Crosset. He wrote a book called The Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Our Lord Jesus Christ. And in there he pulled together many of the different practices by which one could grow in a knowledge of the love of this heart and also express love in return. And so that was Father Crozet. He was one of the earlier Jesuits to begin promoting this devotion. In time, in the 1800s, the Society of Jesus accepted this as what it called a most pleasant mission. And so we have a general congregation, the governing body of the Jesuits, in 1883 writing this. Let it be decreed that it is definitively laid down that the Society of Jesus, with the greatest pleasure and deepest gratitude, accepts and assumes the most pleasant charge entrusted to her by our Lord Jesus Christ of practicing fostering and promoting devotion to his most divine heart. Then in 1915, in another general congregation, it was declared that the apostleship of prayer, which began in 1844, would be the most suitable way for this devotion to be promulgated and expressed and furthered by the Jesuits. So that's how the apostleship of prayer gets involved in this. That's how the Jesuits got involved in promoting devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And I have to say that I'm very happy to be able to be a contemporary apostle of the Heart of Jesus and to, in whatever way I can, spread the knowledge of his love revealed in his heart and in the power of this devotion. You know, after the Second Vatican Council, many of what we call devotions went by the wayside. And in many ways, this was unfortunate. Of course, the idea was that they should never replace or get in the way of the celebration of the Eucharist, which the Second Vatican Council called the source and summit of the Christian faith, the Christian life. However, it's the devotional life of the faithful, our prayer life, that helps us to bring hearts open and on fire to the celebration of the Eucharist. So that we come to the Eucharist not just as bodies physically present waiting to be entertained, but that we are there to pray with hearts on fire, knowing the love of God revealed in Jesus and in the Eucharist. And so devotionals 
are very important in the life of the church. Devotions, devotional practices, prayers, they're very important for warming our hearts that we can then bring to our prayer. I grew up in a family that really did not have a devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. I don't remember any picture of the Sacred Heart in my family's house. We never enthroned or consecrated our family to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. But I can say that growing up in the 1950s and the 1960s, we had a very strong Catholic life and a very strong devotional life. I can remember going every Sunday with my parents to Mass, once a month to the Sacrament of Reconciliation, and learning prayers. And in our parish, the particular prayer that was important during the middle of the week was a devotion to the Mother of Perpetual Help, Mother Mary of Perpetual Help. So I grew up in this traditional Polish-American Catholic family where I would say my heart was touched by our religion, by the Catholic faith. And so when I entered the Jesuits at the age of 19, while I didn't have an explicit devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and while none of my formation directors or personnel really promoted this in our early Jesuit life, my heart was open to it. And I can remember my brother novices thinking um, that I had some connection to the heart of Jesus. They'd give me holy cards with a picture of the heart of Jesus and speak about this. So somehow or another in my life, there was this incipient, this kind of underlying devotion, which began to grow and flower. In time, my interest grew, not so much uh, in terms of prayers, saying prayers, but in this kind of heart-to-heart -heart relationship with the Lord. And I can remember in the 1990s, I was the formation director for the Jesuits of the Wisconsin province. And at one point, I was visiting the Jesuit scholastics who were on retreat. These are the Jesuit seminarians. And I was there for the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. I presided at the feast and gave a homily. And I can remember in the homily talking about some of the contemporary music of the time that spoke about the heart. Uh, for example, Bruce Springsteen had a song, Hungry Heart. Everybody's got a hungry heart. And in my homily, I remember talking about how this heart that we have, we're not talking about our physical heart there. We're talking about this deepest interior of ourselves that is longing to know love and to be loved. And this is the hunger of our hearts that Bruce Springsteen sang about. There was another song too um, by Bonnie Raitt in which she talked about have a heart. Speaking to the one that she was in love with, she asked him, have a heart. And of course, he had a heart. He had a physical heart. Obviously, she's speaking of something different, that when we have a heart for another person, our whole being is open to that person. We, we are sympathetic and compassionate toward them when we have a heart. And then there was a song that Janis Joplin uh, sang about. Uh, it was A Piece of My Heart, um, where her heart was being broken by the one she loved as he walked away from her and, and she said, take another little piece of my heart now, baby. Well, you know, obviously she's not saying, here, take my physical heart and break off a piece of it. We all know from this music that these songs are talking about not the physical heart, but something else. The heart is a symbol of our deepest interior, the place where we love and experience love. So, more recently in my Jesuit community, again on the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, I remember speaking to my fellow Jesuits about the necessity of Jesuits having a heart. I said that we, Jesuits, are often known as the brains of the church because we're so educated and we have universities and colleges and many of my brother Jesuits get terminal degrees of doctorates of one kind or another. And I said, 
you know, that's an important contribution to the church. And the Lord called Jesuits to do that. It was as though we were the, the head, the brains of the church. But our Lord knew that without a heart, the brains could go astray. They could think maybe too highly of themselves. They could get proud. And so our Lord gave to the Jesuits this commission, this mission of promoting devotion to the heart of Jesus. It's as though Jesus was saying to Jesuits, you need a heart. You need the sacred heart of Jesus to balance out all that intellectual development. And in fact, Father Pedro Arupe, who was general of the Jesuits during the time of the Second Vatican Council and until the 1980s, in his final address, this was at a conference on Jesuit spirituality, and it was shortly before he had a stroke that debilitated him. In this address, he said this, if you want my advice, I would say to you, after 54 years of living in the Jesuits and almost 16 years of being its general, that there is tremendous power latent in this devotion to the heart of Christ. Each of us should discover it for himself if he has not already done so. And then he goes on and says this, perhaps what we need is an act of ecclesial humility, uh, humility to the church, in which we accept this mission from our Blessed Mother, from Jesus, from past popes, saying, I want Jesuits to promote this spirituality of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And we need to be humble enough to accept that commission at a time when many people have thrown out devotions of one kind or another. He said this, I am convinced that there could be few proofs of the spiritual renewal of the Jesuits so clear as a widespread and vigorous devotion to the heart of Jesus. When I read that, I took that as my marching orders, as the director of the apostleship of prayer, to do whatever I could to help in this renewal of the society of Jesus by spreading this devotion, hoping that in the process, my brother Jesuits would catch fire themselves. Why is it that they need to catch fire? Well, unfortunately, much of religious art in the 1900s, the late 1800s, into the 1950s and 60s, really did not do very good service to this devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Let's face it, much religious art was very sentimental. Um, in fact, in many cases, trying to uh, portray the, let's say, intimacy or the tenderness of Jesus, Jesus was made to look very effeminate. I like to say some of this Sacred Heart art uh, portrayed a bearded lady Jesus, where he looked very feminine but had a beard. Um, and that was, you know, trying to make the point that our Lord is tender. Well, Unfortunately, that kind of art turned many people off to this devotion. And in throwing out the art, they also threw out what was most important, what the art was trying to portray, this tender love of our God. The heart, as we've said, is a universal symbol. And again, we're speaking not just about the physical heart, but what it represents, that the heart sends life, blood through the body. And so our deepest interior is, let's say, the source of our spiritual life as well. It's the symbol of love. We have Valentine's Day and all the many expressions of love that are contained there, symbolized by the heart candy shaped like a heart. I even saw Papa Murphy's advertising a heart-shaped pizza this year. So the heart is a symbol of love. And we know this 
deep down that when we have expressions like my heart goes out to you, we're not saying that our heart is leaving our bodies. Or when we say he wears his heart on his sleeve, obviously we know the heart hasn't moved from a person's chest to their sleeve. It's a way of saying that this person is very compassionate or is, is very moved by people's sufferings. And so it is with Jesus. Sacred Heart devotion is not so much about a physical organ. Uh, people will ask, well, why don't we have a devotion to the head of Jesus or to the stomach of Jesus, the gut? Well, it's because in many cultures around the world, the heart is a universal symbol for love and for what is deepest in a person. And everyone understands this. I wrote a little book some years ago, it's for children, and it's a, a book based on parish mission talks that I would give. I would go around to all the classrooms of the kids and, and ask them questions about Valentine's and the heart, and ask them if they had ever seen an image of Jesus with the heart, and of course they all had seen that. And I remember one time asking um, a group of second graders, now look at this picture of Jesus. His heart is on the outside of the body, but your heart is inside. Why do you think his heart is on the outside? And this one little girl, without missing a beat, without thinking much about it, said, well, maybe he loves us so much he can't keep it inside. And I thought, out of the mouths of babes can come such wisdom. She got it. She knew that this heart is a symbol of love and that the reason it's on the outside of the statues and pictures of Jesus is because it's a sign of his love that always goes out to us. Again, remember the expression, my heart goes out to you. The heart of Jesus always goes out to us and is always there. And that makes his heart very vulnerable. That's why in the imagery of the Sacred Heart we have the thorns surrounding the heart. His heart is always able to be rejected and hurt by people in the way that we treat him and treat one another, his body, for we are the body of Christ. And as St. Paul wrote, whatever we do to one another, we do to Christ. And Jesus said that too in Matthew chapter 25. So we do hurt the heart of Jesus by the way we treat one another. That's why this devotion is not some kind of individualistic devotion, a Jesus and me kind of spirituality, but it's meant to be a spirituality that has us share the same desires, concerns, and love of the heart of Jesus, which is for our brothers and sisters. Now, some people will ask about this devotion and say, you know, I'm not really interested in something that has no scriptural basis. Uh, where can you find this in the Bible? Where do we read about the sacred heart of Jesus in the Bible? Well, it's not something that necessarily is there explicitly, but the heart is a very important symbol in the Bible. Uh, first of all, in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, the word heart is the word that is used most often to describe the deepest interior of a person, what makes someone human. Of course, it's also used to talk about the heart of the sea or the heart of God as well. But in the Old Testament, it appears over 800 times to talk about what is deepest in a person. And when it talks about sin, it talks about a cold, hard heart, a heart that no longer has the warmth of love, a heart that has become hard by sin. So in the Old Testament, the word heart clearly speaks of this deepest interior of a person. And do you know where it appears most often? You know which book of the Bible it appears in most often? That book of the Old Testament is the book of Proverbs. That's part of the wisdom literature of Israel. That tells us something, that the heart is, is not some sort of lacy, sentimental, valentine kind of heart. It's not a passing emotion, 
but it has to do with wisdom. We have a lot of head knowledge in our world. The world, through science and technology, has gained great knowledge and understanding. But the question is, have we grown in as much wisdom to know how to use all that head knowledge that we have? Do we have the wisdom to use all our technology the way it should be used, for good rather than for evil? And that's why the heart is so important. It's the place of wisdom. Jesus spoke about his heart in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10 and 11. He says, come to me, all you who are burdened. Take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and humble of heart. And in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, chapter 14, chapter 15, we see Jesus observing the crowd. He gets out of a boat or he's with a crowd that he's been teaching and they're hungry. And it says that his heart was moved with pity. That doesn't mean he was having a heart attack. That means he was filled with compassion for the crowd which was suffering. He said they were like sheep without a shepherd. So his heart is moved with pity. It goes out to the people. And then we see the heart of Jesus in John chapter 19 where St. John writes, he was an eyewitness, remember, he was right under the cross with Mary and a few other women. And he said that after Jesus bowed his head and died, a soldier came with a spear and thrust it into Jesus' side. And immediately blood and water came out of this heart of Jesus. His heart was pierced. So we do have the heart of Jesus, the heart of God appearing in the scriptures. And I think it's a reminder to us, again, that we're not talking about sentimentality or a physical heart, but something deeper, the place of love, the place of wisdom. In English, we only have one word for to know, and uh, it's the word to know. And in German and other languages, they have two words. In German, you have Wiesen. And that's to know facts and data, to know about something. There's another German word, kennen, and that's the word that's used to know a person, to know people. See, there's a big difference between knowing facts and data, knowing about someone, and knowing someone. I like to use the example of an optician and a spouse. The optician looks into your eyes looking for glaucoma and cataracts and things like that. And to gain, let's say, scientific or head knowledge about your eyes. And that's very important. And the optician knows something about you. But does that optician, optometrist really know you the way the spouse does? And how does your beloved, your spouse, look into your eyes? Not the way the optician does, looking for that kind of knowledge, but with a different knowledge. You could say not so much on knowledge of the head, but a knowledge of the heart. That's how the beloved looks into our eyes. And that's how Jesus looks into our hearts and into our eyes. He loves us with this deep love that can only be symbolized by the heart. Well, that's pretty much the first chapter of my book on the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and the, it sets the stage for all the chapters that follow, helping us see that this devotion is not to a physical organ and it's not meant to be sentimental, but is, is something very deep. It also sets the stage for the devotions, the prayers that will follow. Every chapter of my book follows with a prayer practice an expression of devotion that can hopefully help you grow in an awareness and appreciation of the love of Jesus. In chapter two, then, I tell what I like to call the true love story. Remember, there was a book and a novel uh, and a movie that came out called The Love Story. And I call the story of the Sacred Heart of Jesus the true love story because in this love story, we see the truest and deepest love the world has ever known. 
It begins with the Blessed Trinity. This great mystery of our faith that God is three persons, one God, a communion of persons, a communion of love. And God was perfectly happy within himself. There was no need to create. But it's the nature of love to want to share that love. And so God creates this beautiful planet, this world, this universe, and creatures, human beings, capable of receiving this love and entering into an intimate, loving relationship with God, our Creator. We're made for union with God. The angels aren't made for union with God. The angels, according to the first book of the Bible, Genesis, weren't made in the image and likeness of God. But human beings are. We're made for love. We're made by love. We're made for love. We're made in the image and likeness of God, who is love. And so God wanted to share this love. You could say that the beginning of Sacred Heart devotion goes back before time. It begins in the heart of God, who is devoted to us. I like to say that Sacred Heart devotion is not so much our devotion, but God's devotion to us. And our devotion is simply a response to God's devotion, to God's love. In fact, we get that in the first letter of St. John chapter 4. This is that famous uh, passage in John where he says, God is love. In other words, God in God's very being, this trinity of persons, God is love. And then he goes on and says this, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent the Son as an expiation for our sins, to take away our sins. And then shortly after that, St. John, this is in chapter 4 of his first letter, writes, we love because God first loved us. So it's not a matter of us having a devotion that might win God's love. God loved us first, and our devotion, our love, is simply a response to that love of God. This word devotion, you know, if you look it up in the dictionary, it will say that it's a strong attachment or affection. And then a second definition talks about ardor or zeal. Ardor has that sense of fire. So it's, it's natural that in our imagery of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, we get fire coming out of this heart, this ardent love of God. And God's devotion means he has a strong attachment to us and a great affection for us. So much so that when humanity rejected God, God's love, God's plan, God was still attached to us. So much so that God sent his son to live our life, to share it, to suffer, to die and to rise in order that we might follow that same path and be one with God forever in the kingdom of heaven. I like to say that the passionate love of God led to the passion of his son. That word passion, again, if you look it up in the dictionary, the first definition with a small p says a deep desire. God has a deep desire for each one of us. And it's a, such a deep desire that even if we were the only person in the world, still he would have gone to the passion with a capital P, which refers to the suffering and death of Jesus. The passionate love of God leads to his passion. And Pope Benedict wrote about this in his first encyclical, God is Love. He talked about how in the Old Testament, Song of Songs, the prophet Hosea, we speak of God's eros, or passionate desire for us. It's the word from which we get the word erotic. God has a deep, passionate desire for us, for union with us. And this eros, the Greek word for this deep desire, love, leads to agape, which is another Greek word for love that means total self-sacrificing gift. His eros, his desire for us, leads him to even sacrifice himself for us. 
In his Lenten message for 2007, Pope Benedict wrote about this. And here's how he put it. He said, on the cross, it is God himself who begs the love of his creature. He is thirsty for the love of every one of us. Remember, one of the last words of Jesus on the cross was, I thirst. And Blessed Mother Teresa, in all of her communities of the missionaries of charity, wherever they have a crucifix displayed on a wall, next to it, she has the words, I thirst. And then she adds, for you. As a way of saying that on the cross, Jesus was giving himself totally for our love. Out of love for us and for our love. And so his words, I thirst, certainly were a physical thirst, but also a spiritual thirst, the thirst of love. I thirst for you. And then Pope Benedict said this, the response the Lord ardently desires, there we have that word ardent again, ardently desires of us is above all that we welcome his love and allow ourselves to be drawn to him. See, it begins with our awareness of God's love and allowing ourselves to be drawn to him. In fact, Jesus predicted in earlier in John's gospel, uh, Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I shall draw all people to myself. Because this is the deepest love, the love that every hungry human heart has to know such love. Jesus draws us all to himself. And our response is simply allowing ourselves to be drawn to him, to let his love draw us, and then to live that love by the way we live our lives. So Pope Benedict goes on, accepting his love, however, is not enough. We need to respond to such love and devote ourselves to communicating it to others. In other words, when you know you're loved, your natural tendency is to want to love in return. And so as we know the love of God, we in turn want to return that love to God. And if you love someone, you love what that person loves. You tend to share their interests and desires, their concerns. So insofar as we love God, we love our neighbor. Because if we truly love God, we will love what God loves. And what God loves is our neighbor, who is brother and sister to us. There's an early Greek bishop by the name of Diaticus who I think sums this up very neatly. He said, the measure of our love for God depends upon how deeply aware we are of God's love for us. The measure of our love for God depends how deeply aware we are of God's love for us. It all begins with God's love. And that's really the essence of this sacred heart devotion. To let our cold, hard, sin-hardened hearts to be transformed by this fiery love of God, which then, as we are more and more aware of it, will lead us to a transformation, have lives transformed, filled with the love of God, we'll want to share that love with others, especially by witnessing to it in the way that we care for one another. So this sacred heart of Jesus, on fire with love for the Father and for all of humanity, is given to us to ignite our hearts so that we might love God and love our neighbor. That's ultimately our goal in life, what we're made for, union with God and the communion of saints in God's kingdom. So I invite you to uh, read my book and pray over it. Uh, we'll be talking in our next conference about chapters three and four, and we'll be going more deeply into this great mystery of the sacred heart of Jesus seeing how it is a Eucharistic devotion and therefore very important for our Eucharistic life, for the way that we celebrate Mass and the way that we live the Mass in our daily lives. Ultimately, Sacred Heart devotion is not about saying a few prayers, which may be good, or going to Mass on First Friday, which is excellent, but 
Sacred Heart Devotion is about our hearts being transformed by the love of God so that our life is made a total offering to God and we love other people as God has loved us. So thank you for being with me and we'll talk to you the next time.